Hi. Today we are going to understand the basics of seven quality control tools and where and how to use them for effective problem solving. And along the way, I will also try to answer some frequently asked questions and explain some of the common misconceptions about the seven QC tools. So, let's begin. As the name suggests, the seven QC tools are a set of tools or techniques used in quality control, or more specifically, to collect the data in order to understand the situation and analyze the facts to identify a problem. Mr. Kaoru Ishikawa, the creator of these tools, has said, as much as 95% of the quality-related problems in the factory can be solved with seven fundamental tools. I agree with that statement. But there are two key points to note down here. Number one, just like any tool, these tools are here to help us get our job done. What I'm saying is, in spite of the fact that they are known as the problem-solving tools, they will not magically present a countermeasure for the problems. But if properly used, they will assist in collecting the data and analyzing the current situation so that we can make an informed decision about how we want to tackle our problem. Now, since our action and decision will be based on data, it is absolutely essential that the data is to be collected and analyzed in such a way so as to reveal the facts. And that is exactly the role of 7QC tools in problem solving. And secondly, like any set of tools, each tool here has a specific purpose. And just as a hammer cannot be used in place of a screwdriver, similarly these tools cannot be, or at least should not be, used interchangeably. Otherwise, we may not get the intended results. So, here are the 7 QC tools we are talking about. Let's review each one of them in details, starting with histogram. Each process has a natural variation. That means the outputs of any one process will not exactly be the same. And this variation is generally a normal distribution. We have already studied this phenomena in the normal distribution of the statistical process control series. If you are not familiar with the concept of normal distribution, I recommend you to go through this video first and then come back here again. You will find the link in the description below. And if you are comfortable with the phenomena of normal distribution, location and spread, we can continue. So, with histogram, we can diagnose the present condition of our process. Here are the steps to create a histogram. First, gather the data. For demonstration purposes, let us consider this data to represent thickness variation in 100 metal blocks. Then, determine the number of classes. Depending upon the number of data we have, we can choose the number of classes using this table. So, for our data of 100, we can consider the number of classes as 10. That means we are going to distribute our 100 values in 10 classes. Now, calculate the size of each class. In order to do this, first identify the minimum and maximum values in our data set and then calculate the range of our data and then divide this range by the number of classes. This will give the size of our class. Now, since our unit of measurement is 0.01, .01, let us round off our class size to 0.04. Now, if you want to make calculations simpler, you can also take class size as 0.05. In that case, the number of classes required to cover the range of 0.37 will be 8 or 9 only. So, whether you want your class size to be 0.04 or 0.05, it is totally up to you. There is no hard and fast rule here. Let's create the histogram now. On the x-axis, we will plot the classes. We have taken a class size of 0.05, but we do not know the starting point. There are two methods. Either take the minimum number, that is 3.31 as the starting point, which will make 3.36 as the end point of first class, and then keep on adding 0.05 for further classes. Or, to make calculations simpler, we can create a class like 3.30 to 3.35, so that the minimum number falls in the first class, and then keep on adding 0.05 for further classes, till the class for the highest number is made. On the y-axis, we will plot bars with their heights representing the number of metal blocks that fall within each class. So, if we sum up the values of all these individual bars, 
it will add up to our data size that is 100. One problem that we may face is for parts like 3.40 where the question becomes whether to keep this part in this class or in the next class. There are few rules for this but again to keep things simple at 0 0.005 in each class point. So 3.30 becomes 3.305 to 3.355 and so on. Now we can easily place our parts in these classes. Finally, mark the specification limits in the histogram, add a title and we are done. Now how to use this histogram? Once we have plotted this data, the first question to ask is, what is the most common thickness of the metal blocks? How much is the distribution? What is the shape of the distribution? Is the distribution symmetrical? A skewed histogram to the right or to the left is inherent for unilateral tolerances as in flatness, hardness, runout. But for bilateral tolerances, it may also represent that an adjustment is being carried out in the process after regular intervals. If the shape is cliff-like, it could mean that the process is not capable of meeting product specification and a portion of the production that is not good is being inspected out. So the process is relying on the inspection to meet the specifications. If the shape is comb-like, that could mean the inspection method is not precise. As a thumb rule, the least count of the measuring equipment should be less than the tolerance of the product divided by 10. So if the dimension spec is 3.2 to 3.9, the tolerance range becomes 0 0.7 and the minimum least count required for the measuring equipment should be less than 0 0.07. If the shape is twin peak, that could mean that there are basically two data sets and we need to stratify the data according to different factors. For example, if I plot two different histograms for this twin peak, histogram A for the parts produced in A shift, and histogram B for the parts produced in B shift, I may get something like this. And the combination is a twin peak. So we immediately know that something has changed between shift A and B and continue our investigation in that direction. Other than shape, also look for the relationship with the specifications. Is the product fully inside the specification? If not, what percentage is out of specification? Is the average value exactly in the center of specification? See, just by looking at the histogram, we can have so much information about the process. And that's almost everything we need to learn about histogram. We will study the remaining tools in the next lesson. See you there.